I'm honored to have Jeremy Grantham join me today. Uh, Jeremy is the co-founder and long-term investment strategist at GMO, uh, which manages over $60 billion. Jeremy, thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure. You know, I, I must say, Jeremy, we've had many conversations uh, over the last 20 plus years, and I've always looked forward to them, uh, including this one. And what is undeniable uh, to me in, in my experience uh, with you is your passion about the market, uh, the economy, the history, looking backwards and being a market historian, looking forwards, being a visionary. And I'm really curious what originally sparked all that interest. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, what sparked my interest in the stock market was... Um, just uh, buying and selling a few shares when I was a, a young man and, and the, the fascination of wondering why they rose and fell and then uh, taking to the, the Wall Street uh, Journal and reading the kind of recommendations and, and discovering the hard way how kind of random they all were. So it became like a, a puzzle. What, what drives the market? How does it function? Why does it function? And the more I got into it, the more whimsical it seemed to be. <laughs> and so I kept going. In, in terms of history, I, I what can you say? Some people love history and other people don't, and I do. And you know, you, you could say, why do I study the Vikings? Who knows? Um, I just I like history, and stock market history is, falls in that same range. You also have this remarkable ability, which I, you know, in my experience is rare to zoom out and see the very, very big picture. I feel like most people are zoomed in and they see kind of what's right in front of them and, and the near past. But you have this, this uh, at least great interest in zooming out and seeing the really, really big things. And, and later on today, we're going to talk about the extremely big picture. Uh, what would you say sparked that interest? I don't think it's an interest. I think it's who you are. It's a kind of type. And... Um... I have no choice. You have no choice doing it your way. I have no choice doing it my way. I, I want to ask the bigger question and the bigger question until you hit the ceiling. You uh, hit the question that the, the teacher is not comfortable answering uh, or your parent or anybody else. Just keep going until you can frame it in the largest possible way. And I found that the the higher the level, the more it was interesting to me. And so I did it. I guess also when you zoom out that far, the zoomed in picture doesn't seem as important because your perspective has really changed. That is a major trouble uh, with, with that approach <laughs> is that an awful lot can seem trivial. And uh, I didn't notice that so much in my first 10 or 20 years in the investment business. But as time went by, I did have a harder and harder job concentrating on quarterly earnings you know what's going to happen in the next quarter when is your factory going to come online when are you going to debug it and so on what about the delays and at one level for 15 or 20 years i was fascinated by it part of the puzzle and then suddenly in the space of just a few months i thought oh my god if i hear another stock broker tell me another quarterly story i'm going to throw up and uh, I, I better take a rest. And I took a rest by moving up to bigger picture items, uh, sector analysis, small cap versus large cap, quality versus junk, cyclical versus non-cyclical, and, uh, and, and country analysis. And then finally, um, asset class analysis, comparing one asset to another, even including things like timber. Really, really interesting, particularly when you haven't done it. And so that gives you a, a new lease of life for, for 10 or 15 years. And then maybe that in turn becomes a little less exciting. And so you ask the next level of question, what are the real problems facing society? Whoops, there are a lot of those. What's the condition of democracy and capitalism? What, what's the condition of the environment? What does climate change represent? What are the risks and toxicity, population shifts? running out of resources. 
the general concept of overshoot. Have we, as a society, run too far too fast without any regard for long-term well-being? Are we creating too much waste? Are we poisoning ourselves? Are we like the bacteria in, in the dish? Are we uh, gobbling up the sugar and uh, go- about to die in our own waste? So that level is kind of where I am now. And coming down to uh, the old levels that I was so happy with, I really feel that that is kind of fiddling while Rome burns. Yeah, it's really interesting how your your career has progressed from the smaller items to the bigger items with time. And, and the other thing is, most people get pretty bored. There are one or two people in the stock market who've been doing more or less the same thing with great intensity for 40, 50 years. I really admire that. I haven't been able to do it. I've had three or four discrete 17-year careers, usually with a five-year overlap where I'm doing two things. And that's why I can squeeze four of those into 50 years. But uh, without that, I would have gone crazy. Uh, you, you need a, a pretty broad shift once in a while. You only live once. You might as well cover some broad territory. Well, let me take you back a, a few years, uh, all the way back to the early 70s at Battery March, you, or, where you, you kind of launched your career. And uh, you came up with the idea of indexing back in 1971. Would you tell us about that? My senior partner and I, it was a partnership, uh, Dean LeBaron and I went to... Uh, a friend of his was running a uh, a, uh, a course for mid-level endowment funds. And uh, it was, uh, I think, an Easter course when the, uh, the troops were away from Harvard Business School. And um, the course he was teaching was picking between managers. You're a pension fund officer. You're an endowment officer. How would you pick between? And they had... Morgan Guarantee Trust, J.P. Morgan, who owned a very big chunk of the institutional business. Then the second one was T. Rowe Price, which was new and was introducing this almost heretical emphasis on growth, which was, believe it or not, quite novel still in 71. And then even more novel, they had uh, a battery match where we were doing small cap value. And small really wasn't a thing, and value really wasn't a thing. So we had two non-things combined. And they ran through the case, and at the end, as they often did, they said to the two guys at the back, they introduced us and said, had we got any points to make? And did they, the class, have any questions to ask us? I can't remember what the questions were. There were quite a few I can only remember the one point that I made, and that is I was kind of surprised that when looking at the data in the case, where they compared these three with the S&P 500, that they hadn't thought of giving their money to the gentleman from Standard & Poor's, because on a risk-adjusted basis, it looked like a shoe-in for the safe decision. And and, uh, we came back from that trip, and uh, the idea was born. Uh, to do indexing and and uh, battery march became a pioneer and um, we split the business with uh, really with wells fargo one for them one for us but it took us a couple of years until we got our first i think it was a bell telephone system new england tell i think before the first account arrived and we didn't get the first account the first account was Samsonite pension fund who walked into Wells Fargo and said, I want to own the market, do it for me. And on the strength of that, they got the claim being first, which is pretty uh, sneaky. That's amazing. Uh, You left uh, Battery March in 1977 to launch GMO. Why did you leave and what, what would you say was the vision at the time? And how has that changed over the last almost 50 years? There was no real shift in vision. We were ambitious and um, wanted to create our own firm. We took really the same portfolio, the same ideas, stay out of heavy traffic, do the things that are less discovered and and likely therefore to be cheaper and and measured much cheaper, like small cap value. And um, that was pretty simple. What you didn't ask is 
how, how we got to Battery Much, I arrived out of the consulting business into Keystone Funds, which was almost as big as Fidelity and located in Boston. And I got off to a running start doing a few unconventional reports. And uh, the unconventional portfolio manager was clearly Dean LeBaron. And so <laughs> I propositioned him. And I left nine months after arriving in the business. I left with Dean, two of us, and, and off we went to, uh, to make our fortune or try. And, you know, over the last half century, what, what would you say are the biggest changes you've seen in the investment world, just in general? The whole damn business really has come and gone. I mean, when we started at Battery March, there was no serious pension fund business. The ERISA laws had not been passed. So basically, shortly afterwards, they, they were founding pension funds. And of course, they were underfunded because they were brand new. So there was this glorious surge for maybe 20 years where pension funds caught up with the funding that they required for a defined benefit plan. So Battery March and, and early GMO rode, rode the glory years of defined benefit. And uh, the second big shift, of course, was the kind of intellectual um, leadership moving to the leading endowment fund. And we had a wonderful position in that area at uh, GMO. In our early days, we had all, all of the Ivy League. And uh, so great clients to talk to, the David Swensons of the world and uh, the Andy Goldens. It, it was, uh, in that sense, thrilling on a Friday evening, I'd put my feet up and call three or four good friends, and they were good friends, and uh, Hilda Ochoa, who ran the World Bank Pension Fund and then spun off to run her own investment shop. Um, and, um, you know, you learned as much from them, or, or more than they learned from me. But we were all thinking, uh, le leading thoughts, you know, we were trying to get a jump on, on the competition. And... Uh, particularly in the first couple of decades. There weren't many others. We moved very fast and took quite a lot of risk, tried everything we thought would be possible, possibly work. And uh, our attitude was if it doesn't work, it's likely to be random. And if it's a new insight, it's likely to have some out. And in general, we won those bets. And you know, for everyone that failed, four or five actually worked, which is with glad in the heart of any VC manager that I've ever come across. And um, and we and we generated a huge alpha just for the record. Uh, it, by two thousand and five or six, we'd uh, been in business since seventy seven, and we had four hundred thirty five, I think it was four hundred thirty five product years. Every product, and we had many times the years they'd been in business, and two out of three years of those product years we had won, and our shot ratio was one point five times the market because in every case value gives you a lower risk profile uh, in except one case emerging markets where we were dead level and uh, and we had a an alpha unadjusted for risk of 2.9 percent across all our funds including a couple of uh, specialty uh, bond funds emerging debt in particular so we i reckon it was the best broad record at that point uh, in the business and do you feel that alpha has been as gradually become more difficult to attain as the competitions become more fierce and you have the entry of computers and eventually AI and, and all that? I would guess yes, in general. The, the strange thing is that if you look at the market, you probably have to say the stock market shows every sign of being just as crazy from time to time as it ever was for 2,000 at 35 times earnings was the biggest outlier in history. And that was deep into the new quant era with PhDs cranking out straight, in, straight into the investment business. And we had an, we once had three particle physics PhDs at the same time back, back in, the, in the early 2000s. Times were, were changing very fast and, and, and there was a lot more talent in the business. But the market, nevertheless, in aggregate and the sectors and the for example, today, if you price low growth against high growth, it's about the biggest it ever gets. If you price emerging markets against 
the US. It's about as wide a gap as you ever see, US up and emerging down. And, and as recently as 2008, emerging sold at a premium PE to the S&P, and now it sells less than half. These are huge swings. That suggests that at least at the macro level that I'm interested in, there's still a lot of inefficiency to go around. At, at, the, at the down and dirty level of trading stocks with the uh, high intensity algorithms and so on, I would strongly suspect that uh, life is considerably tougher than it was. If they had arrived with their tools or even approximately their tools uh, 30 years ago, they would have, they would have uh, made more than a killing. And maybe as you zoom out a little bit, you know, from the micro stock picking to sectors and countries, et cetera, it may be that that some of those advantages disappear and you're left with the human biases and the blind spots that that the, the humans tr- doing the trading have. And maybe that's what is still exposed. Yeah, no, I suspect you're right. And um, we also have, we've had to deal with uh, in recent years, some completely unique events that um, I suspect have a lot to do with the monopoly power in America and and the shift from being fairly tough on monopolies for 70 years, but in the last 20 years, kind of giving up on that, letting them do what they want. The concentration in every industry has increased. I, I believe that's accurate, every single industry. And in one or two, it's increased dramatically. And even more unusually, we've seen the instant international monopolies, the the Facebooks and uh, Microsoft's, Apple, Google, and and they're all young firms. Apple and Microsoft kind of started with GMO. These are not the Procter & Gamble's that were old in 1929, you know, or the Colgate's and so on, the Merck's and the Lilly's, J&J's and Exxon and Chevron's. Or, or even IBM, they they were all down there in the in the Great Depression, and these guys are all um, early middle aged or teenagers, and um, you know they've changed the world, and and they have had, they've become very very powerful monopolies really, and uh, that that has caused some very unusual things. The U.S earnings against the rest of the developed world 2010 which is 14 years has gained 70 80 90 percentage points it's never happened before 10 or 15 or 20 was a lot and then it would tend to rock back the other way for five or ten years but here it's been steady and it's been massive and if you ask what caused it that's also remarkable something like 85% of all of that gap is caused by two handfuls of new super monopolies, global monopolies. And there's some of the most exciting companies, I think, in the history of capitalism, I have to say that. And yes, the rest of the uh, S&P has moderately beaten in earnings the rest of the developed world, but it's beaten it by the normal amount, you know, 10 or 15% of the kind that we're used to. The... The truly exceptional stuff is caused by these truly exceptional two handfuls of uh, megastars. And they have changed the world because they have not only had a lot of earning power, but they have also done a lot of crushing of uh, weak assistance in their industry. You sell books for a few minutes, and then the next thing you know is every book chain is out of business, and, and then you're selling everything. And uh, these, these are big events. And if you, when we get around to mean reversion, we'll be wondering whether there'll be a very slow kind of mean reversion for these guys where society is not happy with that kind of power and, and moves against them. And you see that beginning quite easily in the EU in particular. And... Um, and the EU is a powerful block. And, uh, and of course, China is very important. It's also, in this sense, a kind of wild card. They can do what they want, when they want, and they are not averse to big moves on occasion. 
Let, let me ask you about those those U.S. stocks because they're they've been the darling for a long time, and it's obviously become more concentrated. There, there is this uh, general perspective when I talk to investors that these are the best companies in the world. They're dominant. They're growing. Their earnings are strong. It, it seems like they can only go up. How do you how do you think about that? It reminds me, we used to when I, when I was kind of more engaged in the front line, which I have not been for fifteen years at the kind of portfolio level, stock level, and so on, you used to wage war on, on language. You're not allowed to say, are going up. Every time you said that, I would say, is that a forecast? You have to say, have gone up, because uh, it's easy to describe the present and make it sound like a prediction, unless you're careful. And when you use that language, you tend to think, of it, and, and you get into the habit of thinking that because something has done well up to yesterday, that it's quote, doing well, i.e. in the future. And uh, that's not how life works. You're just describing the past. And where where are they going? Um, as, as we said, they're unique. They're bigger. They've moved faster. They've been more instant monopoly than we've ever seen in history. And they came in a clutch. And um, most of them were out of the American venture capital industry helped along, which is the biggest and best in the world. And, and, and that has had something to do with, with the fact that they occurred here. Uh, the only rival really was China. And, and for whatever reason, they moved against their uh, superstars of five or six years ago and, in a sense, kind of took them out of that little basket. So um, they have been the best companies in the world and maybe. Uh, they'll continue, some of them, for a while, and maybe some of them will have hit some boundary that the role of uh, China in, in the life of two or three of them will will prove to be significant. Apple, Think, and Tesla you know that, that um, they are very dependent on the Chinese market and, and Chinese manufacturing. And if that changes, they have to do an awful lot of reconfiguring. And um, for most of them, there are there are limits. They're moving into each other's market, and they're and they're facing resistance to monopoly uh, and takeovers. I think when you get companies that big and that par- powerful, and and in a sense that good, you shouldn't allow them to buy armies of little companies or any big companies at all. It's not healthy for capitalism. I always used to say you know, 20 years ago with great confidence and earlier that uh, if an industry or a company gets way out of line in its return on equity, you expect it to mean revert because when capitalism is working smoothly, high returns attract competition. The money comes pouring in and low returns frighten it away. So capital goes out, a few survivors get time to regroup, have little competition, and and they come back. Well, they used used to come back. And I think that that was an accurate statement. If capitalism is working smoothly, you expect mean reversion. If capitalism is not working smoothly and has been overtaken by a high degree of monopoly and companies that are so powerful they get to call the shots, then um, you're not going to see that mean reversion. And we have not seen it. We saw it for 100 years, and I'm happy to say while I was investing, it continued. It was very well behaved up to and around 2005, 6, 7, when I began to get out into, let's call it communications. It behaved very well. There were some indications from 2000 onwards that uh, all was not well, but the factors, value or low growth and small cap were so cheap and REITs that you made a bundle anyway. And then it became revealed that uh, the mean reversion machinery was not for the time being working as well as it had for the previous 100 years. That is a big shift. And I suspect what we're talking about has quite a lot to do with it. And of course, there's the factor of discounting, meaning it, when when investors look backwards and they see the great run of these dominant companies and they extrapolate that into the future with great optimism that even if they continue you know repeating the past 
the returns may not hold up because there's so much uh, discounted already. Yes, exactly. If you double the price, I like to say you have the return. Nothing we can do about that. You just get a much lower return. And when you buy in at a high level, today is in the top 1% on the Schiller PE of all time. And when you start from this level, you have a very hard time going up materially, but you have done once or twice, but you've only done it for a while. In the last gasp of 1929, in, in the last gasp of 1999, and so on. And, in, and notably, and most impressively, in Japan, where maybe for two and a half years, you kept going. And uh, in each case, they ended incredibly badly. So the price you paid for bucking uh, that kind of law was a very high price. In general, if you want to make a lot of money and you want to have a long bull market, you need high unemployment, depressed profit margins, and depressed PE. It's beautiful double count. Multiply depressed earnings by a low PE. It's really double count. Multiplying peak earnings by a high PE, which is what we're doing today, is also double jeopardy uh, the other way. And the gap between peak PE times peak profits all the way down to trough PE times trough profit. That's a big run. That's the kind of thing we, we saw ending up in 1974, in 1982, in, uh, to some extent in, in uh, 2009. Yes, it was much higher in 2009 than 82, but the discount rate, interest rate, everything else had shifted. And, and it was down an awful lot from its peak. And it's not just magnitude, it's also duration. It's also duration. You, you want a multi-year bull market. You want to go in there in 09, and you have a reasonable shot of a 10-year-plus bull market. You go in there in 82, and you have a very good shot, of, as it turned out, an 18-year bull market. And so it goes on. 1932, you just go straight up forever, decades. And uh, that's, how you, that's how you make real money. But it feels good at the top of a spike always feels terrific. And people always torture the logic to think that in 1929, it's, quote, a new high plateau. <laughs> 1929, in the most predictive model that I have, have come across, uh, which is run by Hussman, is the only one that is about the same as 2021 and a little bit higher, both of them, than today. These are not good times to start a 10-year bull market. And yet, one or two bulls are saying, whoopee, this is the beginning of a great bull market. Well, you know, sometimes things happen that are really obscure, but it would be unparalleled. Uh, the closest you could ever come to is Japan, and the one before that would be the 2000 tech bubble. 2000 tech bubble broke through the record PE of 21 and went to 35. That's not bad. And, uh, and you paid a commensurately higher price than normal. And then the best one, Japan, it went through a previous peak of 25 times earnings, and it looked like 65. There was a lot of double counting. They had some very, very strange counting, which is now washed out of the system. And really, it wasn't 65. It was much more like 35, the same as the tech bubble. But it was a hell of a run. And then, of course, you, you had 20 lost years as you ground up in the stock market and, and of course, in the land business where they had a double bubble, biggest land bubble in history, the biggest stock market bubble in history, simultaneously, not bad, 1989. Land is still not back to where it was in 1989, but last week or the week before, the stock market in nominal dollars made it back to 1989. Uh, that's only 15, 20, about 35 years later. Uh, and you still haven't adjusted for modest inflation, but 35 years of even Japanese inflation means it's really got to go up another 45%. You've touched on the notion of reversion to the mean uh, a couple of times. Uh, it's something I know you've been writing about, talking about for, for decades. How has the uh, framework changed over time or has it? And, and how do you deal with the risk that uh, it could take a long time to revert to the mean and the, maybe your patience runs out before that reversion occurs? I must say, other than reference to history, it's very hard to know how to predict things. So when they're brand new, new events, I, I do tend to stand back and, and, and take it easy on, on predictions. AI being such a wonderful example that we can come to. Mean reversion had such a 
promising history, not just in the stock market, but in life in general. Things, patterns tended to show up and repeat. Civilizations would overreach and live beyond their means and deplete the local countryside and they would fail. So you'd have, going back into you know, Babylonian times, you had these patterns that tended to repeat. So they're kind of useful. And they were much more useful and much shorter term useful in, in the stock market. And Keynes, of course, famously said in 1932, put it this way, he would have said, the cocktail party, if you'd asked him, that the market can stay irrational longer than the investor can stay solvent. There is no record of him actually saying that, but everything he wrote uh, meant that. And, and he clearly believed it. It's a tough time fighting momentum and career risk. If you make a big bet against momentum, you're taking a very high career risk. And every now and then, strange things happen. A market move can, can be longer than the client's patience. So we always felt we were trying to prove or disprove Keynes when, when he said that. He was saying basically a value manager uh, was not a sustainable bet. And it, it came pretty close in, in 2000. You know, it went through the peak PE that we were used to at the end of 97. And we were in pretty good shape. And we had stayed invested, I don't know why, all the way through 21 times earnings, the 1929 peak. And then we started to phase out. And as it went 21, 25, 28, 20, oh my God, then we really phased out. And my stump speech was uh, Jeremy Siegel and others, where I was the bear and they were the bulls. And I was kind of arguing that these things always ended badly. Uh, and what they were arguing, I, I never really did get. But um, I guess this time is different, would be the essence. And it was different in the sense it went to 35 times earnings. And one has to concede 35 is a lot higher than, than 21. And it was quick. That was a saving grace. It, it was only two and a quarter years, but uh, it was slow enough to have a lot of client shooters because they believed that it was a golden new era that Greenspan was telling them about, that the internet would drive away the dark clouds of ignorance. He was very poetic, old Greenspan on the topic of, of, of improvements. And he was really, by the end, preaching a, a golden new era. He talked about irrational exuberance in 96. The, some subcommittee of Congress had kind of slapped his head and said, don't interfere with our bull market. And so he did. And he retreated on that topic and never mentioned it again and led everyone to believe that, that all was cheap. Anyway, that, that was a, a severe challenge. But when things turned, we had all our money in the cheap stuff. REIT yielding 9.1, TIPS yielding 4.3. 4.3 real TIPS. Wow. Right at the peak. And small cat was incredibly cheap on a relative basis and uh, absolutely a little bit cheap. And by the bottom of the market, it was up a few percent. The S&P was down 50 and, and, and it was up uh, 3 or 4 or 5 percent. That's a hell of a gap. The RE REITs were up, up, actually up over 20% at the very bottom of the market. Think of that as a gap. And uh, it meant the S&P would have to go up 140% the next day to close that gap. <laughs> and the bonds, of course, were glorious. So um, our portfolio made money in 2000, and made money, decent money in 2001, and scraped home by arguably nothing, half a percent in 2002. But the S&P was down 50, and we'd made money in each of the three years. So we survived. We lost a lot of business. It all came back with huge interest and uh, became much bigger firm over the following four or five years. So we thought we'd pretty well proved uh, Keynes uh, wrong on that issue. We had, by a narrow margin, we had survived the shock. And, and again, we had had a hard time um, fighting the, uh, the magnificent, et cetera, <laughs> as, as a lot of people have had. You know, you either own them or you don't. And if you don't, you're in a different league. And if you're buying, quote, cheap stocks, you're not going to keep up. And um, so we have suffered a second time. And now the question is, will we be uh, vindicated as we were the first time? And uh, I suspect, yes. At every cycle, by the way, people always think that the heroes of that cycle will keep going forever. The Nifty 50 one of the reasons we had the Nifty 50, which is 
back in the in the sixties finished uh, peaked in kind of seventy two was they were called one decision stocks. They were so good you only had to buy them and hold them forever. And they were the J's, J and J's, and the Mercs and the IBMs and so on. And and I went back and looked in the record book, and none of them had failed for like twenty years, which is unusual. And then what happened in the following ten years is you took out Avon and shot it and Xerox and shot it and Eastman Kodak, which was a giant above suspicion and shot it. IBM, you half shot it, it limped off the battlefield, more dead than alive and then regrouped. But when you do that, you you expect a very different outcome and you got it. And the, the Nifty 50 were terrible performers for 10, 15, even 20 years, they, they looked very sad. And yet they looked untouchable. They looked magnificent. It was so obvious. Why aren't you buying these great companies, you idiot? Why are you buying Twin Disc Clutch from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, you know, when, when you could be buying IBM? And, uh, and so it is this time. And will it turn out the same way that it did with radio and so on in 1929 and each of these iterations? Or will this time be different? And that's what we, in a sense, wait to see. And I suspect it will turn out very similarly. Each one has a separate spin, and Lord knows these are more impressive companies, I believe, than they have been in other cycles. To, they owe a lot to government decisions to allow them to buy every small interesting company in the field and or important rivals, et cetera, et cetera, as do all the giant companies in America. This has been a, a good era for giant companies. They have really been calling a lot of the shots in the government. They have been allowed to spend money like water, of course, since the famous uh, Supreme Court decision. I wrote it up under the heading of Supremely Silly, the idea that companies would be able to spend unlimited money and not really be required to report it to the actual owners of that money, their stockholders. I think having being disallowed to spend any money in politics would be a brilliant start to uh, a better breed of capitalism. Let's take a moment and talk about bubbles. You've written and uh, extensively about the idea of bubbles and studied it uh, over a long period of time. But where do you see bubbles today? And would you consider AI in a bubble similar to what we saw with the internet in the late 90s? Very quickly, let me give you the history. We studied every commodity, currency, et cetera, and stocks and so on, and stock markets looking for bubbles. And uh, at the asset class level, we found a lot uh, that met our definition. We had to define it. We defined it as two sigma. You have a series of data points, and you can have this statistical term for an outlier, two sigma, which in a random world would occur every 44 years. And actually, in real life, seems to occur about every 35, which is really remarkably close, closer than I would have guessed. So you have quite a lot of them. And in, in the developed world stock market, every single one of them, which is a lot, you know, there's, I forget how many, but maybe 70, 80 of them, they all went back to the pre-existing trend, the trend that existed prior to the bubble forming. There were one or two uh, in the developing world where you were making a move, say, from agrarian economy to a more manufacturing economy, where the price would actually go up and stay up for a long time. I get it. It's a good time for a paradigm shift. And there were one or two commodities, which got me interested in commodities, that made paradigm shifts. Oil, the best description of oil is that it was flat until OPEC in 1972-74, and then it, it jumped up and stayed up. And you'd have to say the history of oil is that the price has been pretty strong. And it looked like a paradigm shift, OPEC. And uh, I, I, I got the, a chart in the New York Times uh, offering Oil is the first important paradigm shift that I come across. So how, how, do, how are we fixed on, on that level? Where are the two sigma? Uh, the U.S. market is past two sigma. Uh, on the upside, it is, in that sense, a technical bubble. The, the, the interesting bubbles, what I call the super bubbles, though, have to have other characteristics. And we had those characteristics back in 2021. And the most interesting and unusual one is that the speculative leaders suddenly start to go down fairly big while the broad blue chips continue up. 
So you've got this beta of one and a half. You're meant to be rising one and a half times the market, and, and the market's up 20. And instead of being up 30, you're minus 35. <laughs> that, that happened in 1929 to so the low-priced index, flaky little names. They'd been up 80% in 1928, and they were way down the day before the crash. They'd been declining all year in 1929. Believe it or not, like a primal scream from the stock market. And, and then nothing like that ever happens again until you, you get to 1972. 1972, I can remember because the S&P is up 17 and the average big board stock is minus 17. So I get to remember it. But that's a pretty big gap. And then nothing like that happens again until 2000. Most of you were around in 2000. And you will have noticed that the leadership, the great speculative growth companies and the pet dot coms, they all kind of imploded in, in early 2000. By June, July, August, they were down, a lot of them, 70, 80%, the small ones, and 30 to 50%, the big ones. And the S&P, the rest of it, was still climbing. And uh, it, it went to a co-equal peak in, in uh, September, uh, which meant that the non quote, growth stocks had, had risen about 15 or 16 percent while the growth stocks were getting hammered uh, to leave the S&P flat. It's a remarkable and rare thing. And it happened again in 2021 but when uh, the leadership of all the meme stocks, remember them, and uh, AMC, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, Kathy Wood's very interesting portfolio that had been so brilliant, they all started to nosedive and it was led by my own particular spec, which I'd invested in seven years earlier, QuantumScape. Uh, I had a huge position as a venture capitalist. Uh, and uh, it came as a spec, which I hate, and had said very nasty things about publicly in uh, September 2020. And by December, it had gone from the usual 10, which was four times my money, to 131 which was 50-odd times my money, biggest position I ever had. I wasn't allowed to sell it for six months. I wasn't allowed to hedge it or anything else. And um, it peaked in December 2020. But the other things, the new issues peaked in January, February uh, 21, and uh, so on. And Kathy Woods was topping out in, in the late spring of 2021. By the end of 21, aggressive growth stocks had been hammered. But the S&P was up over 20%. That's an amazing fourth example. And it, it predicts death and destruction. And I wrote that. And, and for the first half, I wrote it under the heading of waiting for the last dance. And then when we got there, we called it let the wild rumpus begin uh, on Jan January the 1st, more or less, of 22. In 22, the first half was the biggest first half decline since 1939. Everything, including the, the bond market, dropped like a rock. And uh, by the end of the year, there was a lot of grief around. And the end of the year also coincided with chat GPT, which, which was like a, a snake in the, in the garden party, from my point of view. It changed everything. And I tried it very quickly. And, and, and like everyone else in the world was impressed with it, began to see considerable potential. And even though there's only a few handfuls of them, they, they dragged the whole market up for 10 months and the rest of the market was drifting down to flat. They were standing there with their jaws dropped, I like to say, admiring the, uh, admiring the action of those handful of, of AI stocks, selling the shovels to the, for the gold rush, you know, people buying chips that they might never use, but what the hell, we'll try and use them and we'll represent ourselves as using them. Everyone wants to represent themselves as madly developing uh, AI. I understand that, perfectly good idea. And so that scrambled what was looking like a fairly, a relatively well-behaved bubble. They always take longer than you think to break, but it had broken decently. And I thought was probably going to continue down. And then we got that strange action that carried the whole market initially watching it, and then finally losing patience in November and participating. So we've had November, December, January, February, four months of, of pretty broad participation, completely egged on by AI. 
and uh, to a level where we have totally full employment, totally wonderful profit margins, all the things you would not want to start a bull market from. This is where you start bear markets from. Great bull markets start with exactly the opposite. But it always feels wonderful. Peak profit margins getting there takes years, and it feels nice. And so you've got a great track record. You can't get to peak margins without leaving a terrific track record. So you've got a great track record. You've got the peak PE, so you feel wonderful. The stock market has gone up and up and up and up. So everyone feels great, and that's how you get to a market peak. You feel great about everything. Of course, almost by definition. And when do you start going down? You still feel great. You just don't feel quite as great as you felt the day before. That's why it's so damn hard at both ends. The light at the end of the tunnel is a complete joke. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. The market turns when things are totally black, but they're just a subtle shade less black than yesterday. How are you going to see that? That is pretty tricky. And by the time you see the light at the end of the tunnel, boy, you've missed the first quick, easy 30%. Yeah, I mean, the the consensus sets the price. So timing when the consensus changes their perspective of the future is really tricky. Yes. And hanging over it all is that slight chance that the game has changed, which is what the bulls always say. And up until now, they've always been wrong, but they can be right. And uh, I had a, a debate with Jim Grant where I took the argument, this time is different, about uh, five, five or six years ago. And uh, you know the old cliche about what's his face, the old fund manager who said, John Templeton, the four most dangerous words in the English language, uh, this time is different. And indeed, they were pretty damn dangerous for 100 years. But, but I wrote in a quarterly letter that I thought the five most dangerous words are actually this time is never different because occasionally it is. Japan going to 65 times earnings, pretty different from anything that preceded it. The oil in the OPEC going up four or five times in a hurry, pretty different. And it changed the world in many ways and it stayed changed in many ways forever. We never went back to a pre-1972 world in, in energy. So it does happen. So that is, uh, you know, every value manager should have that pinned on their doorway, along with a few other things. Uh, you have to be aware it's possible that things are different, even though history says they very seldom really change. The reason they very seldom really change, they're all based, as you were saying, on human nature. And human nature is the one more or less inflexible point in life. We, we're capable of being crazy dudes, just like we were thousand years ago or the South Sea bubble in 1721. And we're still the same crazy dudes when we want to be. And we're perfectly capable of being sensible and pessimistic and careful and, and all those good things too. In terms of, you know, this time is different. Uh, let me ask you quickly about this whole notion of currency. I've, I've always felt that a cur currency is a very tricky thing because it takes years to develop the faith and trust required for a viable currency, and it can be lost in an instant. I'd like to just hear your your thoughts about how cryptocurrency fits within that framework, and if you just generally agree with that framework. I tend to view currency as over my pay grade. It's um, a different specialization, certainly given to uh, odd behavioral characteristics. The psychology plays an incredible role, obviously, in short-term moves. To give you an example, we once watched back in the 80s, we watched the pound go from uh, 230 to 104 and then back to $2. What the hell is that? All of the output of a serious, more or less serious country uh, can, be, can move that much. And you could say the same for um, the dollar. It went from incredibly overpriced to reasonably priced relatively quickly. And um, once you've seen one of those things, you realize, wow, uh, currency is not quite the stable benchmark you had in mind. I don't think, however, which, which important currency lost its plot quickly. The pound you know, went through a couple of brutal wars and racked up huge debts. And the US was growing like a weed in that time period. And by the, by the beginning of the First World War, it had overtaken them in terms of the scale of their economy. 
by the end of the Second War, they were much stronger, bigger, and everything else. And still, it took a few decades for the sterling to kind of go out of use. Even in the early days, when it was clear that the dollar would take over, uh, sterling had a lot of uh, old adherents in the Middle East and so on, and around the world. It wasn't that quick to kill it off. And that's the only one. So my guess is it's not going to be easy to kill off the dollar as the central currency for the, for the world, I don't think. As for um, Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin fascinating. It will go down in the history books as something significant, unique. It's like、um, a chain letter, you know, which everyone on the planet has signed up for. All you have to believe is that someone else will pay more. It doesn't pay you a dividend, and it doesn't create any value unless you're a drug dealer where it's invaluable, or、uh, other bad guys who want to stay off the radar screen. And because of that, it's perplexing to me why serious countries don't ban it because it so facilitates lawbreaking. But、um, it's worth what anyone wants to pay. It's like there's strange images that exist in space, and、um, sooner or later. Most of the value will disappear, nearly certain. But I am not nearly certain that it will happen this year, next year, or even in five years. I just think sooner or later there will come testing time, and people will realize in the end that there's no bedrock value. When you get really nervous, the fact that the cheaper the stock goes, the higher the yield becomes, puts a real break on it. The idea that the cheaper the stock goes, the more dollars of Asset value you have per dollar of stock price puts a break on it, and there are no such breaks in、uh, Bitcoin. And people say, with some justification, you can say the same about gold. I get that, and I have always felt a little nervous about gold. And for the record, from time to time, I have owned a little bit, and I have just sold my gold because it had a nice run, and which is a guarantee for the listener that gold will go up. Really quickly, another twenty or thirty percent, or more. But again, gold has no dividend. I will say this: it has several thousand years advantage of experience over Bitcoin. It does have a lot of really handy industrial uses for some modest fraction of the total. It is a gorgeous-looking metal for jewelry, and、um, that doesn't hurt either. And that's a fairly significant list of advantages over Bitcoin, but still, I'm suspicious of it. I'm just a hell of a lot more suspicious of Bitcoin. But anything that depends on public enthusiasm can go where it wants to go in the short term. We have seen tulips once upon a time, where the highest price, I believe, sold for a decent, a decent house, and、uh, in the end, they went back to selling for like tulips. I suppose when whatever you're viewing as a currency is also difficult to really understand. I, I, I imagine the vast majority of investors don't truly understand it. That when there is a crisis period, you're just going to bail. I would think so. I would. If you really need the money, the economy is looking bad, your job's looking not entirely secure, and you've made quite a lot of money in Bitcoin. Would be. That、uh, that's the asset that I that I'm going to sell. All right, th- th- this is the the moment you've been waiting for. We're going to talk about the really big issues.、Uh, I know that's that's the、uh, your focus、uh, currently and probably for for a long time.、Uh, why don't we start with one of the big ones, climate change?、Uh, what what can you share about climate change? I started trying to filter warnings on climate change. Into the investment community 15 years ago, and I and I must say I got world class eye rolling in return. And、um, you know those days have changed enormously. Every, everybody, except a few ideologues, can't bring themselves to see the facts in front of their noses. But、uh, everyone can see the weather, the climate changing rapidly and dangerously. It's making it's increasing the risk enormously for farmers. It's increasing the risk enormously for people who live in low-lying coastal areas, increasing the risk for people who who live in、uh, in forests, 
where even forests that almost never used to burn are now burning great quantities. And the damage is racking up our recent hosting for this week. It has a pretty well-known exhibit that shows all the billion-dollar first derivative problems, you know, damage from forest fire, damage from flood, damage from droughts. And the, the number has risen very rapidly. And uh, there's a lot more damage that is not in that list, damage to agricultural crops, particularly in the third world where droughts are pulverizing their GDPs uh, because of, of crop deficiencies and, and health. Climate change is, 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 not, is not that healthy in many ways, but you rack up all of those costs and it, and it seems that at least a half a percent and the experts seem to think closer to 1% of global GDP. And 15 years ago, it was completely a rounding error. Seven years ago, it was hardly ever talked about. But last year was the first year where people say, ouch, you know, global growth is two and a half points. It might have been just over three, say, or a few bits higher than that, had it not been for climate damage. We started with 280 parts per million carbon dioxide, and we've kicked it up to 423. And before we finish, if we behave quite well, it will rise to 550. And let me point out the difference between an ice age with two miles of ice on Manhattan is uh, 120 parts per million from 160 to 280. And, and we have just put on slightly more than that. So we have incremented this heat trapping gas by more than the difference between an ice age and a, a wonderful interglacial of the kind that we've had for the last few thousand years. This is a, a, a very rash experiment. And we're going to put on another 120 bits before we finish. Now, if you back up to um, 1964, the year I arrived, we were adding just less than one part per million, 0.8. And now we're adding more than two. So we have escalated the, the amount of damage we're doing every year. And if you escalate the damage, you should count on this. If you escalate the cause of the damage, parts per million CO2, you should count on the damage escalating. And it is. The uh, air temperature has gone up a lot faster since 1970 than it did before. It has arguably gone up a lot faster since 2000 than it did before that. And this last year was the hottest ever, and it was the hottest ever by the widest margin uh, in, in, uh, for the month of February. February was the hottest February by the biggest margin in the history of February. And the year ending February uh, through February was substantially more than 1.5. So we had centigrade. Uh, with 2.7 Fahrenheit. So we'd gone through that infamous, theoretically dangerous barrier for the first time on a, on a one-year basis. So it's a, a very bleak outlook. We have to do better. We are doing better. The question is, can we continue to improve? In the end, we have to have a penalty, a clear penalty on people who uh, push out the CO2. And if that's an extra cost, we have to pay for it. And um, if we don't, the damage will escalate and the GDP growth will pay a higher and higher penalty until we look back and we will realize what the experts have been saying for 20 years. And that is the return on preventing the CO2 from getting in the air is very high indeed. Trying to recapture it or trying to correct for the damage is many times more expensive. Just think of the ocean level rising and starting to flood the low-lying cities like Cambridge, Boston, Miami, and so on. Uh, the cost of doing that rapidly becomes astronomical. So that's the, really the story. The, happily, the world begins to get it. Most of the governments begin to get it. The, the style of, of politics these days is to attack China for everything. But China has uh, tried much harder than pretty much any other country uh, to uh, green its economy. It installed as much 
solar as 1.3 times all the solar the U.S. has ever installed in second place. So more last year than any country in the world, including the U.S. ever. And about two-thirds of the wind. So they did, in a single year last year, two-thirds of the U.S. wind. We've been doing wind for 30 years. And um, these are incredible numbers. The same goes for, they create, uh, of course, over 80% of all the solar panels, over 85% of the silicon that goes into it. They're building more than half of all the nuclear plants that are being built today. They've done really well in hydro. And um, they're way years ahead of their schedule for solar and wind. And yet we managed to attack them. 35% last month of all their vehicles were electric vehicles, fully fledged electric vehicles. Woo. And we're at eight and, and, and slowing down because, because, and we can't sell any electric vehicles in half the states in America, it seems. So we're way at the bottom of the list uh, in, uh, in our response to dealing with climate. That's the really tough side of the equation. So corporations have to pull their weight. as uh, The government switches every four years. It's simply not reliable. Uh, if, we, if we mean to pull our weight, we have to, we have to lean on corporations being sensible and, uh, and setting a good example. Whether that is going to happen, I don't know. Some companies look to be trying pretty seriously, and others do not. So that's one thing. The, the other thing that is much less appreciated and is moving even faster is, of course, uh, toxicity. Human use of every kind is, is crushing the nature. We are crushing the available source of natural services, clean water, clean air, decent soil, our methods of operating, short-term profit maximizing, are really doing a pretty disastrous job on those areas. And uh, one of the outcomes is an enormous decrease in wildlife. Insect population is down 50, uh, guaranteed 50, and maybe as much as 75% of the biomass, the sheer volume of insects. We don't know what will happen as insects go out of business. And they're falling now a couple of percent a year. So we're 20 years away, perhaps, from some catastrophe. And we're not doing anything about it. We're fiddling and fiddling and, and really not addressing it. We've never put much money into research into insects. But every insect expert you could find will say that without insects, they aren't sure that we would survive. We, we have no pollinators. We have no bugs recycling trash, the dung and leaves and everything else. So basically crap builds up on, on the floor of the forest. The, the soil in our um, ag is, is basically sterile. We, through the use of pesticides, basically killed off all the or a large fraction of the vast insect and, sorry, microorganisms that live there, that, that in the end create the vitality that soil, that soil needs. Anyway, so that is happening very fast, but the thing that's most impressive is not the insects, but the, the rest of life. Mammals are also down 50 to 70%. Birds are down over 50%. And uh, what does all that mean? You know, once upon a time, 100% of, uh, of all mammal life was wild. And then humans appeared, and then eventually humans and a few cows and so on. And by 3,000 years ago, perhaps it was 5% uh, humans and, and friends and 95% wild. Today, in horrific contrast, 96% of the biomass of all mammals humans and cattle and pets and four percent the sum of all the elephants kangaroos deer etc it is absolutely shocking and if we keep growing in this way very quickly the four will go to two will go to one and we will find out uh, what that means but it isn't clear that if we just keep doing this that we as a species will be in good shape or even that we will thrive at all.
But the worst thing that we haven't talked about is the effect that the toxicity in the system is, is having on human health. And the worst of all, it messes with our endocrine disruption. And there is a absolutely vast decrease in our eagerness to have sex, which is not a terrific way to repopulate uh, going forward. And every study you find, whether it's peer-reviewed, which is a small minority, or best effort surveys, that is true. Every age group, every country, a rapid decline in sexual activity. And then you carry forward and say, and what about physical ability to produce child, children? Uh, the, the sperm count is down, guaranteed, 60% from its peak. And nothing much happened for the first 50. But in the last few years, the World Health Organization says one in seven couples now needs help, up very quickly from, from almost nobody. And in 20 years, since sperm count alone is dropping almost 2.5% a year, we're going to have 30%, 40% in 10, 20 years needing help. And uh, we're basically on a, on a path to go out of business, and nobody cares. And it's measurable. You see it in peer-reviewed studies. It's pretty clear. And the, the leader of the peer-reviewed studies said, it is as if we mean to go out of business. And getting this through into a world absolutely interested in Bitcoin and absolutely uninterested in sperm count is not, it's not easy. And, and they write books and they write wonderful articles and it just dissipates, just like climate change. The only difference may be it, climate change, we had vested interests. We had Exxon Chevron dedicated to confusing the deal, dedicated to postponing the idea that people would realize the risk and do something about it in the interest of short-term profit maximizing. And the same will happen on toxic. We have 350,000 different chemicals and uh, nearly half a billion tons of plastic every year. And it's all doing a job on our endocrine disruption. It's all making it more difficult to have children and damaging the children that we have. The children that we have are, quote, less masculine in every way than they used to be, on average. And... Uh, People are very careful about these topics and they step around. So there are, in addition to problems with fecundity, the ab ability to have children, there are, and in, in addition to the fact that we're losing our interest, apparently, in, in sex, there are these very well-known, increasingly well-reported reasons why women are, are choosing in the old ratio regime not to have any children if you just wish away toxicity and problems in conceiving they they have a long list of reasons they don't feel they've had a thoroughly satisfactory deal they don't feel that countries are really worrying about uh, child care giving them enough help about uh, time off from work for them and and, and their husband and they don't feel that their jobs are being protected enough. And they are buying into, in my opinion, into the image that capitalism sells, that success is overwhelmingly desirable and consumption is overwhelmingly desirable. So if you insist on getting educated, which is what you need to be successful, and, and women are now taking more PhDs uh, than men in many countries, including the U.S., South Korea, China, and so on. And by the time you've been fully educated, and then you take out time to get your job going, why wouldn't you? And then you take out time to pick out a husband who's at least as well educated as you are, which is getting harder as women's education standards go up. Uh, you, you, you find that in many cases, it slipped through your fingers. You're now too old. And uh, it's not easy to conceive, you know, starting at, at 37. Not as easy as you thought. And, uh, and the population is crashing of babies. Uh, the co baby cohort is crashing in every developed country except Israel. And, uh, and in China, uh, one of the worst. And uh, Russia, one of the worst. So everyone is going to be struggling. 
uh, with declining baby cohorts. And what that means in 20 years is a declining workforce. And the, the sneak preview, of course, is Japan, who started more than 20 years ahead of them, which means, get this, what fraction, their 18-year-olds, what fraction of their peak is the cohort of 18-year-olds in Japan? I mean, it is down 50%. I am not kidding you. Check it. 50%. If our cohort of 18-year-olds was down 50%, which means the workforce is growing at dismally decreased rate, it would be a major league crisis. Japan is such an interestingly different country who is almost uniquely capable of ameliorating these problems, of making them acceptable to society. They have a social contract where people routine are willing to give up a little bit of personal, et cetera, in the interest of, of the society. That is not necessarily the case here. So they have been able to handle this dramatic decline, uh, which is now biting deep into the workforce. We would not have the same ease. And yet we're, we're 20 years or so behind them. We're on the same flight path. Baby cohorts you know, have not been growing. Uh, for quite a few years. In fact, the baby cohort for the entire world, despite Africa doing pretty well in this regard, is no higher than it was in 98. And that's the first thing. People say, oh, the population's growing. Yeah, population, non-productive, old fogey. Um, it's going through the roof. But the population of babies has not been for a long time. So the population of 20-year-olds has not been for a long time. And um, it's just beginning to bite now at the 20-year-old workforce level. They're beginning to see it in university, the loss of, of uh, potential students in many countries. So that, that's pretty tricky. And the third issue, which I'll only give you two minutes on, really, is we're beginning to run out of resources. We've always felt, and economics ignores this problem, but we've always felt that we'd always get by. Uh, price would fix everything. Labor and capital was all you need. You don't need any energy. You don't need any nickel. But in fact, there, there's two or three very common metals. Aluminum and iron or steel are pretty plentiful. Don't have to worry about that for quite a few decades. And then there's uh, sodium and phosphorus, not too bad. But all the nickels and cadmiums and chromiums and cobalts and lithium, oh, God. These are all 0.00 two to 0 0.006 of, on the Earth's crust. And aluminum is, is like 7%, thousands of times more common. Nobody quite understands that copper as well. And these are pretty scarce materials. And, you know, when we used to have 150 years ago, 4% copper ore, and then 50 years ago, you know, 1%, we, we now open mines with 0.2 and 0.3 and you have to dig it deeper and you have to use a lot more energy. And, uh, you know, that's the way life works. You start with the cheap stuff first, the easy stuff, the shallow oil, the, the rich iron ore, copper ore, and you, you peck away at it. And, and so uh, the days of really plentiful and, and, and cheaper and cheaper resources, it's gone for good. And from now on, we're going to have bottlenecks, particularly in the greening area. Green, green area uses so many resources, and, and we're going to have shortages one after another. And yes, it's a very volatile business, so do not think just because you glut the price and it comes crashing down. It'll do that from time to time over and over again into the setting sun. It's the nature of commodities. But the trend used to be down. In the 20th century, the average important commodity came down about 70 bips a year and totaled a 70% decline for the for the cent. That's a hell of a help in real terms. 70% cheaper, the average commodity with oil as an exception. And um, and since then, having gone from 100 to 30 on the index base, it now about 65, having three times in recent years hit 100 again. So it went back to 1900 level as recently as, 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 as 22, 2022. And uh, I much prefer the, you know, getting, getting more plentiful and cheaper. Technology winning out over scarcity, by the way. 
And what's happened now is scarcity is winning out over technology. The balance has shifted. And all of these things are biting together with the food problems and agriculture where we're beginning to pay a price for having denuded the, the soils. We have eroded them away steadily. We, we produce, we lose more soil than, than a bushel's worth for every bushel of corn we've made for the last uh, 100 years or, or since World War II anyway. So we are running through our wonderful reserves of soil. We're doing that everywhere in the world, give or take. And, and, and we've got to change the system. And, and climate change is absolutely not helping. The floods and droughts when you least need it and so on and so forth. That what has happened really is the risk level of farming has gone up. That we run the risk of having major failures now of a scale that we didn't have 30, 40, 50 years ago. And now it's much riskier. And we can get lucky and have wonderful years still. But each year, the soil's a bit thinner and a little less nutritious under big ag. And some of these things are easily fixed if we got our minds to it. If you, if you do no-till, which they do now overwhelmingly in Brazil and Argentina, so they get some things right down there. They have no, very little erosion. And, and a problem. And we do 25% of that, but 75% we're still tilling away. And uh, these old habits die pretty darn hard. Oftentimes, these longer term problems are too far in the distance to pr promote you know, immediate action until they become short term problems. And then all of a sudden, it's it becomes a high priority. Is that is that what you're seeing? Yeah. I mean, we, like every species, we spend a couple of million years de developing a style. And the style all creatures is grab what you can when you can do and um, you know breed and, and and grow and expand and and prosper and yeah you learn the hard way you better save something for winter and it no doubt took a few thousand years of suffering to get that point that eventually you get the point and that's what we do but beyond that as i like to say forget about it we, we're not in the business of planning far ahead for the interests of our grandchildren. We're very good with our grandchildren at the weekend, but basically we behave as if we hate them. You ask every official at the chemical company or uh, Exxon and the oil boys, they're all engaged in activities to try and confuse us, to try and keep pumping more oil as long as they can. You know, whatever terrible chemical they put out there, they deny it's toxic. The, when we were killing the ozone hole, and without fixing that, we would all be getting burnt to death by, by the sun's rays, including insects and creatures in the ocean everywhere. And, and we did brilliantly to fix it. And DuPont, who made the main ozone depleter, had these usual wonderful things, like it's a complete hoax, it's a complete joke, I don't know where they get the data right up to the point where finally, in desperation, uh, everyone signed on the dotted line, and, and, and that's our one great success. But we had uh, Bloomberg the other day featured DuPont and Triple M uh, on, on these forever chemicals, PFAS. They never go away. In nature, there's nothing that will break them down, and so they get in your body, and they also happen to be endocrine disruptors, as if we needed that. And, and there's like 10,000 of these damn things. And uh, they arrived with a note in the file, you know, to Triple M, be advised that this is associated with cancer. Yeah, so what happens? So Triple M produced endless products using this product, these PFAS. And um, that's how it works. The same with tobacco. Has, has there ever been a situation where they said, oh dear, yes, we're killing people, we better improve? If there is, let me know, someone, because I have never heard of it. I know that they were ingenious at confusing the tobacco situation, the so-called merchants of doubt. I know that the Exxon and the boys caught with their files open, I like to say, because it's clear in the 70s that they knew exactly how dangerous CO2 was and that it came from burning oil. And, uh, and they had a research vessel and they wrote some decent papers. And then a new 
president comes in, sells the boat, fires the scientists, and and puts money into obfuscation. Let's make this as difficult and as complicated to see what the truth is as we can and buy ourselves another 10 or 15 years. And they did. And in the process, they have cost us, and without American leadership, it's cost the world, 10 years, maybe 15 years. We may not, in the end, be able to afford that. This is, I call it the race of our lives. This is not clear to me that we're going to win this because we're fine-tuned to grow at any price and to be short-term. And this is everything that that is not. And um, it's a big ask to get us to reduce our consumption in the interest of our grandchildren, to et cetera, et cetera. This is not our style, and we're not doing it very well. And uh, I like to use Kenneth Bowling's one of the two or three economists I approve of. He's now deceased. But he helped introduce the idea of spaceship Earth. Spaceship Earth hurtling through space. It has what it has. It has the fuel that it has. It has the nickel that it has. And there is no base, space base, that it can go and repair and, and refuel and load up on photon torpedoes. You know, If we use up, we've used it up. And one of the things that everybody knows uh, who, who reads any science fiction is if you're going on a multi-generational trip to some distant star system, rule number one is your, your regenerative gardens. First of all, they have to be regenerative to keep people alive. You can't pack all that food. Secondly, you calculate it to the second decimal point. You can support 8,000 people. So the last thing you can do is have half of them decide it's their divine right to breed like flies. And I'm sorry that if this offends anyone, I'm just telling you what a spaceship obvious reality is. Think about it. Of course you have to have the same 8,000 people carefully budgeted for on the whole journey, or you will end up eating each other and fighting for the last scrap of food. And as I like to say, well, dudes, we do live on just such a spaceship, and we are breaking the rules. And we are going to stop breaking the rules, or we'll pay a very high price. And the spaceship is so large that most can't see it. Although it's a fairly obvious thought when you put your brain to it. <laughs> this, is not, this is not the most convoluted analogy one has ever heard. And we are moving at very considerable speed flashing through space. And has our delay in forcefully responding have us doomed, or, uh, or is it, does hope remain? Is there, is there some, some way out of this pickle that we find ourselves in? We call it the race of our lives for the last dozen years, and we occasionally make a big effort to produce a paper on that topic, because the science is moving wonderfully fast. Uh, the Grantham Foundation, which has over 90% of my money, we, 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 do, we put our money, up to 50% of it goes into green tech. And we, so we're bumping into these guys. And, and they are really, unlike most capitalists, they really care that they are part of the solution. And they are wonderfully creative. And we try not to invest in anything that won't have a decent chance, if it works, of changing the world. And there are plenty. And a lot of them will fail. But... In general, that theme tends to grind forward. So I'm pretty optimistic there's at least a 50-50 shot one day that fusion will work. There's probably a 50-50 shot that geothermal will, will become much more accessible and widespread. And, and there are, it's a pretty decent chance that other forms of green energy will emerge that we haven't even gotten our brain around. And there's a, a really guarantee that the, the cost of storage for wind and solar will continue to decline, which, which it has done brilliantly. And now we're far more effort is going into large-scale storage as opposed to uh, you know, driving a, an EV. And, and I'm pretty confident that will continue to decline, as will the cost of solar. The average um, solar panel will be down 50% by the middle of this year, over two years, once again. So uh, the cost of the panel itself now is becoming almost a rounding error. 
it's all about licensing and installation. But the the electricity generated is on the margin, uh, of course, virtually free. And even if you throw in the cost of the solar panels and the construction, it's cheaper than the than the cost of shipping the coal and burning it. If if I give you a coal plant today, it's more expensive than building a solar panel uh, array from from ground zero, and and the gap is widening as we sit, and it will continue to widen, particularly for the next uh, year as as the new big drop in in Chinese pricing of solar panels comes through. But the technology of wind, they get bigger and better and and intrinsically cheaper. And and that will continue. So some of these things and ways of capturing CO2, ways of improving farming, there is just a myriad form of brilliant development, really exciting. On the other hand, every time there's a new Almost every time, 80% of the time, there's a new paper in a peer-reviewed journal. The, the, the argument is, whoops, we have just discovered this. Things are a little bit worse than we thought. This is tough. So the science is moving faster. The damage is moving faster. And we still can't even decline the increase in the CO2. It's the second derivative, for heaven's sake. We have to get to zero CO2. And we can't even get the increment each year, which is over two parts per, per, per million now. That's a peak. The last three years of the highest three years in the history of math, increase in parts per million. So we haven't even turned that first derivative corner. Wow. Uh, so it's going to be a hell of a horse race. I'll tell you a way I like to put this, how close it is. If you give me people of 100 years ago, and the technology of today, one and a half billion people and today's technology, hey, we're going to cruise through this problem. Don't waste my time. It's not a problem. But reverse that. Give me today's population and the technology of 100 years ago, and we are toast. We have no chance. Everything has come down to that little window of a 100-year gap between technology and population. And to get to the to the most controversial point of all, I guarantee the population will crash. My personal guarantee, you can come and collect uh, on, on in 50 years. Um, there is no chance, even without electricity and the messing with our endocrine disruption and the ho- hormones in general, even without that, it's been proving very, very difficult to turn anything around. There have been you know, 100 different ways to try and get women to have more babies, and they are not doing it. They are having steadily less. And now they move into even greater problems. No, the population is going to crash. And how long is it going to take us to detoxify the entire environment and wash it through the system? How long is it going to take us to change the imperatives for your typical young woman so that there is more value on having children. There's more value on family and husbands helping and all of these things and more value from society. So we're willing to pay more to help in terms of childcare. We're willing to pay more for general health of of pregnant women and so on. And how long does that take uh, to change the system? Well, according to us, we think it's quite likely that in 150 to 200 years, six to seven, eight generations, uh, we will the population will be down below 4 billion, maybe as low as two. That gives us a chance of winning. It takes a lot of load off, doesn't it? A lot of load off uh, climate, fewer people, fewer gallons of oil being burnt, fewer, f- less food is needed, less water is pumped. Everything becomes easier. The problem is if you if it goes into free fall and it's it, it drops so quickly that it cracks the economic system and um, you lose the plot, you you drift or you surge to the right and, and you have dictators doing strange things and you start fighting your neighbors. We have got to have kind of Goldilocks come to our rescue. We have got to decline the population fairly steadily without it going into free fall. 
and to keep the system together. We need to be healthy. We need to do science. We need to have the money to to convert to a green system completely. This is not a trivial cost. And then when we've converted to the system, we need to suck out every one of our 550 parts per million, which is a dead weight to do that. There's no natural payoff. Someone, the government, et cetera, we are going to have to pay for that. That will be more expensive in total, according to us, than greening the entire global system. Because when you do the global system, you're replacing stuff. Your refrigerator needed to be replaced. Your heating system needed to to have a space heater of a more modern kind, et cetera. Your car was antique. You get an electric car. Everything needs to be replaced. That's a huge saving. But when you get to the end, 70 years from now, 1890, you get to zero parts per million increment each year. Then you're looking at 550 parts per million, and you've got to get not all of that. I'm sorry. You've got to get it back to 300. So 250 parts per million. I think it's uh, about $3 trillion. I mean, it's a, a lot of money. And it can be, on paper, afforded. It's going to be pretty difficult if the, if the GDP and the population are declining. Depends when you get started on this. But we have to do it. If we don't do it, water levels rise and, and so on, and it keeps going. And that, that's a huge, heavy lift. But I think the saving grace, we have two saving graces over the old civilizations that fail like clockwork. And they all fail, by the way. You, Every one of them felt, no doubt, that they lasted so long, 800 years, et cetera, that they would last forever. But of course, eventually, they, the soil was too salty or too little, et cetera. They all gone completely. And the water supply was inadequate. The droughts lasted too long, and the civilizations failed. And they all failed. And we have, I think, two reasons to be the exception, the great exception. And one of them is the technology has reached such a level that for the first time, we have green energy. Every wave of technology has taken more energy, more energy, more damage to the planet. And this time, green energy, particularly if we get fusion to help, even if we got real religion and, and did a brilliant job on fission, that, that would help even more. But... Uh, it's a huge advantage that we reach these inflection points in technology. And the other inflection point is population. It will go down. So if we can take advantage of that, we don't deserve it. It's in fact quite the reverse. It's the result of our bad behavior. It's one of the great ironies that I've discovered in my life that we may make it because we behave so badly. Mean reversion in a sense. Or you could argue the Gaia or whatever you call the planet strikes back, you know, we, we screw up the, the environment and in turn it screws us up and so we become fewer. And um, with much fewer, we really can make it. But we have to become uh, sustainable. We have to learn to live a slightly different way. We can have quality, quality improvement. We can emphasize the quality of life, but we have to be able to recycle everything, build things to last for a long time, emphasize high quality like they do in Japan in almost everything and make having children at the 2.1 level replacement level, make that a kind of virtue. And um, so we've got to change the spin of capitalism and we've got to detoxify. If we do that, uh, we, can, we can come through. But I would say it's, um, it is a big ask. This is not easy. And it is far riskier than the average investor thinks. And I used to think 10 years ago that we had a long time. And even five years ago, it seemed like we might have a long time. But you can see now climate biting hard now, population of birth. It's only in the last two or three years that people are starting to write about it. You can see the data every time. And... Um, and, and the resource problems, people trying to get their brain around how much lithium, cobalt, nickel we need for all these EVs. And, and it's always shocking. And how are we going to do it? And the answer is, with considerable difficulty, and we're going to have to take money and ingenuity. 
and we can do it, but we need to try harder. In terms of innovation, that one potential saving grace, how does AI fit into that? Does it help inform us to make a to change direction, or does it just drive us off the cliff more efficiently? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, what do you want? The good news first, or the bad news? <laughs> It, it will facilitate almost every one of, of the bits of good news. Every technology will get a little quicker, a little better, faster. AI represents speed. That's the way to think of it. It makes everything that's going on quicker. So you're going to improve IVF to, to help you have a baby. You're going to help farming. You're going to help batteries, you're going to help fusion, maybe. You're going to do all these wonderful things. You're also going to do all the bad things faster. If your system driving us off the cliff because it's ignoring second, third order problems, like all this lovely growth comes with all that horrible waste, all that horrible poison of pesticides and plastics and so on, all these unintended consequences that it more or less guarantees failure if you just keep going blindly without attempting to change it. So you have a system that is more or less guaranteed to self-destruct. It's simply using up resources in a finite spaceship faster than technology can do anything about it. So what will AI do? AI will speed it up. So as you suggested, the end of your question, it's going to drive us to the cliff faster. And yes, there'll be little eddies and currents that are also improving, which will slow it down. But as long as the system was in total going off the cliff, this will get you to the cliff faster and more efficiently. It will profit maximize if it's told to. It will do everything faster and it will not. So you have to wait for round two. A round two requests and the unexpected answer comes back guys, you're missing the point here. This is all short-term self-destructive. You're missing the second and third order things. I can see the second and third order things. You're going to bury all the insects and, and the sperm count will go to zero and you're going to fail. So we suggest you do not ask for these things. How long do you have to wait until AI is so smart that it's no longer facilitating what you want, but is saying, guys, get a grip what you want is self-destructive. I'm afraid that is going to be quite a few decades, if ever. Now, ever's a long time. If we were to keep the system going long enough, you'd have to believe that AI becomes aut autonomous unless you do incredible new and unlikely things to stop it. Now, does it become one level of autonomous or many separate? levels. Is there one AI opinion telling you how to behave sensibly? Or are there competing models that are autonomous and they have different ideas and they uh, compete in some way, dangerous or other, otherwise? So life gets to be very complicated. But for the first several decades, until certainly you're a dead of old age, <laughs> I would say it, it's, it's guaranteed to merely accelerate a badly designed plan. Even though there will be dozens, hundreds of little improvements to make you feel good along the way. But in the end, it is just increasing consumption, increasing energy use. And let's riff a second on energy use. Are you aware of how unbelievably energy intensive this thing looks like it's going to be? It looks like come back in a few years and it may have kicked up energy demand by 20%. It is a prodigious energy user. And if anything is likely to push us quicker over the edge, it's that. Now, if you could come up with such unexpectedly dramatic, fast progress in something like fusion, or maybe geothermal, such splendid progress that you could drill a well anywhere and turn it into electricity, um, from uh, from the heat of the of the core, or you could take the heat of the sun, the, the power of the sun really, and 
and, and, and infusion, then everything changes. You have an infinite supply of cheap green energy, and uh, maybe you could change things fast enough to stay in the game. So it's not without its chances, but I think the main action is faster execution of the current rather self-destructive battle plan that we have. Well, Jeremy, it's been a enlightening conversation. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time and I look forward to many more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please visit our website at insightfulinvestor.org to access past shows and learn more about our podcast. If you have questions, feel free to email us at info at insightfulinvestor.org. And if you enjoyed the discussion, please subscribe to this podcast to ensure you don't miss future episodes. And don't forget to forward today's conversation to others you think would enjoy listening. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Evoke Advisors, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations, nor reference past or potential profits. And listeners are reminded that securities trading, commodity trading, and alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors.